better confession that we can even muster up except that Jesus Christ is Lord. How does that sound? Does that sound pretty awesome or what? And what a gift Jesus is. And the Bible says Jesus is God's indescribable gift to us. And there's sometimes words can't express what he's done for us. And uh, thank you, John and Ben, for leading us through that time. Uh, if you don't know, John, who just led communion, just had a baby uh, this past Wednesday. Well, he didn't have a baby. Carla did the hard work. So, And they've just moved into their new house this weekend. So that's why I asked him to lead communion. He didn't have enough going on in his life. I said, hey, why don't you lead communion? So uh, congratulations, John and Carla and little baby girl, Miranda Grace, that some of you will get to meet and hold here real soon. So mommy and baby are doing good, John? Good. Um, and if you guys are in a place to maybe provide them a meal over the next couple of weeks to help uh, alleviate some of the transition and the burden, contact John, reach out to him. So... We'll make sure you won't go hungry, all right? Thank you. Um, all, two things before we dive into Genesis chapter 4. If you need a little heads up or a little head start, turn to Genesis 4. That's where we're going to camp out this morning. Uh, two things. Number one, uh, we were able to bless uh, the work of Greg and Melinda Main. Uh, Greg and Melinda, we call them Team Polar Pop. Um, they live in an apartment complex down near Chandler Mall, and they're mission is to love the people in that community. And in a couple of weeks, they're going to do kind of a, a kids week there for the kids in the apartment complex and just love them with the love of Christ. And Melinda just said, you know, our budget's tap for, for reaching these, these kids. And so she sent me a whole list of supplies they needed. And we as a church blessed them with all the things they needed to reach that community, and especially the kids in that apartment complex. So thank you for your generosity. And I always like to let you guys know kind of what we're able to do with, with what you give to us and, and trusting us to help and bless others. So you're able to love on probably 30 to 40 kids in a couple weeks and pray that their hearts uh, experience the love of Christ. Amen? So you can pray for them. And uh, who knows, they may, de- may need some physical help uh, loving those kids. So if you're in a position to do that, uh, you know, we'll, we'll let you know about that as well. So uh, Kurt Cornelius, just a quick update. If you guys haven't heard yet, his situation has gone from bad to worse. Uh, they, um, we went over to their house on Tuesday, me and some leadership, and we just prayed with them and Kurt praying with us and just crying through his prayers. And it was, it was a, it was a special tender moment where, uh, you know, he's expressed his, his love for Christ and that's the thing. I've talked to Kurt on the phone. I've talked to him in person. And the thing that he just comes back to is that my sins are forgiven in Christ and I have eternal life. But it's the mental and emotional anguish of going through a season like this, which I can't even imagine. Uh, they went Wednesday to Mexico to seek some treatment down there. And then they just said his situation is so bad. They rushed him to a hospital in San Diego where they're basically giving him a couple weeks to live. And he is currently, as I believe, still in Southern California. And they're trying to figure out a way to get him home. And his situation is so bad that uh, they're trying to charter a private plane to get him here so that friends and family can be with him in palliative care during these, these next few days. So if you can just pray for the Corneals, pray for Jerry, their son Connor, their daughter Cassidy. Their daughter's ready to have their third grandchild here any day. So there's just a whole swarm of stuff going on, and we just need to lift that family up in prayer. And thank you for loving them. Thank you for praying for them. And we'll just try to keep you guys uh, abreast of the situation. So let's pray right now. Father, we pray for the Cornels. I pray for Kurt. Lord, the, the, the confidence that he has expressed in Christ is such an encouragement. But Lord, the, the wrestling inside is something beyond any of our uh, imaginations and what we're able to com- comprehend. Minister to his heart right now, Father, and ease the physical pain. And Lord, perhaps in, in substitute of that, provide him with the peace of your presence that can only come through Christ. Lord, uh, continue to give him the best medical care. Continue to comfort Jerry during this season as she's processing the the, the situation with her husband. I pray for the children, the grandchildren, as they're wrestling with the fact that 
they are going to be losing their, their dad and their grandfather. Lord, I pray that you just surround that, that family with your arms of, of love right now and just provide for them means to get back home and provide the, there to be a context where there's love and there's, there's family and there's community so that everyone would be able to have perhaps a, a time of closure. And so we just pray for your care for them, for your, your protection of them, for you just to be glorified in this entire situation, Father. And so we commit them into your care and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. So, amen. So, uh, continue to pray for them. Thank you, guys. How does this mic sound? Does this mic sound okay? Okay, good. It doesn't make me sound like Sean Connery yet, which I'm a little concerned about, but that's okay. Genesis 4, turn there. So we've just come out of a season where there's been some graduations. And I'm not into, you know what? There was a day when I went to school where you graduated from high school, you graduated from college. It seems like every grade now has this graduation, right? It kind of loses its impact. It's like, I don't care about your kindergarten graduating into first grade, right? What sort of a comp? Oh, does that sound insensitive? I'm sorry. Um, but one of the things that we've always heard at graduations, probably the most common thing that is shared or read is a poem called Invictus by William Ernest Henley, perhaps the number one go-to valedictorian speech, commencement ceremony speech. If you're not familiar with the title Invictus, perhaps you're familiar with the final two sentences of this very famous poem, and they go like this. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Ship is good, soul's better. <laughs> I'm glad Sir William Ernest Henley didn't consult you on how you should end his, his poem. But think about those words. As these young people who, who know so much, graduate from high school, graduate from college, and they're sharing these words, they are poising themselves, or should I say poisoning themselves, with this ideology that many people embrace, that I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That is a way many people live their lives. Who is in control? You. Who is sovereign over your life? You. Who thinks you have all things under the mastery and command of, of your will and your wishes? You. Good luck with that. There are two ways to live. And there are only two ways to live. We live in a world of 7 billion plus people. We live in a world with competing worldviews and ideologies. But if you sum it all down, there are two ways to live. You can live for yourself, as evidence in the famous words of Invictus, or you can live for God. Write that down in your notes, please. Two ways to live. You live for yourself or you live for God. And it's amazing how the Word of God, the Bible, presents us no other stream of thinking. The Bible is masterful in showing us two competing, contrasting ideologies. And you think about the teachings throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. Jesus himself is a master in saying, saying you're either light or you're in the dark. You're either blind or you see. You either have spiritual life or you live in spiritual death. Think about the parables Jesus told. There's the wheat and the tares. There's the sheep. There's the goats. There's the rich. There's the poor. It goes on and on and on. God wants us to understand life is not complicated. There are two ways to live. You can either live for yourself or you can live for God. A few centuries after Jesus and his disciples were here on the planet, there is a famous theologian by the name of Augustine. If you're not familiar with Augustine, write down his name. Perhaps one of the, the greatest thinkers outside of Jesus in world history. His confessions is an amazing account of his conversion to Christ. Perhaps his city of God 
is a better volume to check out where Augustine in this book, City of God, presents us with these two ways to live. And he basically says there's two cities. There's the cities of man and there's the cities of God. The earthly city is built by a love for self, whereas the heavenly city is built by a love for God. One is God-less, one is God-filled. And so the godless culture, of course, begins with man. Man is at the core. Man is at the center and is the very essence of humanism. The other city is built by God. It has its focus on God and God is the core. God is the root. God is the origin. God is permeating the entire culture of that city. Now I'm going to tell you right now, humanism for century upon century, has proven to debase humanity. As much as we are surrounded by people with humanistic thinking, and they themselves may not even articulate it like that, secular humanism ultimately, at its core, debases humanity. It wants what it it wants apart from God, and it's to its destruction and detriment. I mean, if you think about secular humanist thinking in the 20th century, it is what influenced um, Mussolini, it influenced Hitler, it uh, it influenced Pol Pot, it uh, influenced Huxley. You name it, more people in the 20th century died at the hands of secular humanists than the previous 19 centuries combined. Where does humanistic thinking get us? It gets us destroyed. Whereas Christianity, which stands apart from all other faiths and all other religions, doesn't debase humanity. As a matter of fact, it elevates humanity. This is why Christianity and its presence in any culture benefits it. It makes it better. One theologian wrote a book years ago, What If Jesus Had Never Been Born? And he did a survey of 20 centuries of the influence of Christianity. You know where it would get us? We would have no firefighters, we'd have no police force, we'd have no doctors, no nurses, no hospitals, no humanitarian care whatsoever. If Christ had never been born, we would not have any of those things. Because all those things were shaped and influenced by Christian thinkers. Humanism debases humanity. Christianity elevates humanity. There are two ways to live. You live for yourself. And I'm going to remind you the words of Scripture. There's a way that seems right to a man, but its end is destruction. Or there's a way to live for God. And here's where Genesis 4 puts us. At this crossroads saying to us, Which way will you choose? And the rest of Scripture will play this out. See, this is why Genesis, this book of origins, is so key to our lives today. The word that was written thousands of years ago is relevant and pertinent to our lives right here, right now. So if you turn to Genesis chapter 4, we get to read this very interesting section of Scripture as we close out Genesis 4. And it builds upon what we were talking about a couple weeks ago with Cain and his brother Abel. And we talked about how all of a sudden the appearance of these two siblings present to us this beginning of this thinking, two ways to live. Cain, the oldest, Abel, the, the next sibling to be born. Both of them grow into adulthood. They're married. They're having kids. And they're, they're worshipers. And they bring to the altar two offerings one is rejected by God Cain's and one is accepted by God Abel's and all of a sudden we begin to understand that there is a way that we approach God and that's on his terms and Cain chose to present his offering and come to God on his own merit on his own terms and was rejected for it and instead of learning the lessons that he needed to learn he basically remained obstinate to the things and way and will of God and 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 walked away from the Lord 
And in his anger, he killed his brother. And we talked about how important understanding these, these ways to approach God and our, 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 our means and ways of worship are so important. We approach God on his terms, God-centered, right? We don't come to God the way we want to come to God. That's man-centered. So today we're going to look at two civilizations. There's the Canaanite civilization and there's the Sethite civilization. There's one that is born of Cain and there's one that is born of Seth. So the two main points we're going to look at this morning is the Canaanite civilization, which is a self-sufficient society. And I want us to get a picture of what this looks like and what to avoid and what to reject. And then we're going to be in the journey this week and the next into the Sethite civilization, which is a God-centered society or God-dependent society. So turn to Genesis 4. Let's look at verses 16 through the end, and then we'll go back and make some important notes that are found here in this passage of Scripture. If you read ahead, you're probably scratching your head thinking, what is Pastor Scott going to speak on today? My wife, when we were going on our uh, family reunion to Colorado, she's reading me this passage, and she's like, so what are you going to talk about out of this passage? It seems very um, weird as far as some of the language. There's genealogies in the Bible, which are the so-and-so begat so-and-so, and so-and-so begat so-and-so. I'm a big Simpsons fan. I don't know if you, anyone likes the Simpsons. You guys love Jesus. You don't watch that stuff. But Homer Simpson ate the, uh, the, um, the f- uh, fugu fish. What's the fish that has a little bit of the poison? Sushi. So Homer, you know, he's got a voracious appetite like me, so I can identify with Homer a lot. He ate the poisonous fish, and uh, they can, basically he thought he was going to die. So how did he spend his final moments living? He listened to the Bible on cassette as read by Larry King. So you can imagine how exciting that is. And uh, the episode where he's listening to Larry King read the Bible on cassette is, and so-and-so begat so-and-so, and he's snoozing, he's got big drool coming out of his mouth, classic scene. So Genesis 4, here's where, here we go. Verse 16, then Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Now, that's a haunting verse. Cain left the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, which means wandering, east of Eden. And Cain had relations with his wife, and she conceived and gave birth to Enoch. And he built a city and called the name of the city Enoch, after the name of his son. Now Enoch was born, Irad, and Irad became the father of Mahujel, and Mahujel became the father of Methuselah, uh, Methusel, and Methusel became the father of Lamech. If you're pregnant and looking for baby names, great verse to go to right there. Uh, Too late, you already named your daughter, so that's cool. Lamech took for himself two wives. Uh Uh-oh. Two wives. I mean, that's two mother-in-laws. Can you imagine? Okay. Um, ooh. The one of them, keep your opinions to yourself, please, you guys. No, just kidding. One of them was named Ada, and the name of the other, Zilla, from A to Z. He got it, he got it covered, right? Uh, and Ada gave birth to Jabel, and he was the father of those who dwell in tents and have livestock. And his brother's name was Jubal, and he was the father of those who played the lyre and the pipe. As for Zillah, she gave birth to Tubal Cain. So you got Jabel, Jubal, and Tubal Cain. Uh, the forger of all implements of bronze and iron. He was a metal worker. And the sister of Tubal Cain was Nema. And Lamech said to his wives, Ada and Zillah, Listen to my voice, you wives of Lamech. Nice guy. Give heed to my speech. I have killed a man for wounding me and a boy for striking me. If Cain is avenged sevenfold, then Lamech 77-fold. So then Adam has relations with his wife again, and she gives birth to a son and names him Seth. For she said, God has appointed me another offspring in place of Abel, for Cain killed him. And to Seth, to him also a son was born, and he called him Enosh. Then men began to call upon the name of the Lord. May God bless the reading of his word this morning. Two ways to live, for yourself or for God. There's no other options. As illustrated here in this passage, what I'm going to present to you is is exactly this. Avoid the way of self, embrace the way of God. See, Cain 
represents secular culture. Seth, later on at the end of this chapter, represents sacred culture. Cain represents material society. Seth represents spiritual society. Seth is representative of those who rebel against God. Seth represents those who worship God. Let's, let's pull this apart. First, the Cainite civilization. What does a self-sufficient society look like? Two things. It is indifferent to God, and it is independent of God. Indifferent, independent. So here's the crazy thing about this account. What becomes of the person who rebels against God, leaves the land of blessing, angry, defiant, disregarding God's laws and sacrifices? What happens to that kind of person? Well, obviously from this text, he prospers. It's kind of like what Rabbi Harold Kushner wrote decades ago in the title, Why Do Good People Suffer and Why Do Bad People Be Blessed? Why Are They Blessed? See, here's Cain, who's not the poster child of obedience to God, rebels against God. What happens to him? As from the text, it seems like he prospers. Do the ungodly prosper? Yes. But mind you, it is an empty prosperity. Because prosperity without God is empty. It is hollow. It leaves you hungry. It is deficient in the things we ultimately crave as human beings. C.S. Lewis said it like this. If there's nothing in this world that satisfies your soul, perhaps you were made for a different world. How many of us are surrounded by people who have it all and yet are empty inside? People want more and more and more, and there's this voracious hunger within each and every one of us. And Blaise Pascal, the French scientist, said, there's a God-shaped void in us, and only God can fill that void. And yet, won't, don't we try to fill it with stuff? Little luxuries, little hobbies, sex, achievements, jobs, relationships, you name it. We try to fill our lives with anything but God, and we continue to end up hungry. See, prosperity without God will always leave you empty. And any great civilization without God will ultimately be miserable. And I say that because we live in such tenuous times right now as a culture where we just sit there and go, what the heck is going on in our world? What is going on around us? and people are clamoring, and people are arguing, and there's debates, and there's violence, and it just seems like there's this excess of stuff going on all over the place. And yet in the heart of it, you know, we have to ask the question, where is God? I am a student of pop culture. I call myself the theologian of pop culture. I am reading the news. I am watching the news. I'm trying to keep a pulse on what's going on around us. And the question I ask is exactly that. Where is God? Because these things will continue and get worse if God is not a part of the equation. He is the essential part of the equation. And what we have is we have here in Genesis 4 this text of what a civilization without God looks like. Let me describe. So Cain has a little baby named Enoch. Archaeologists have discovered that Enoch is the first word for city in any human language. Enoch is the original word for city. Now city doesn't mean skyscrapers like we imagine cities and museums and churches. And, you know, it could just be a settlement. It could be a village. But the principle remains the same. The idea that Cain left Eden, he left the garden of God, he left the presence of God, he left the plans of God, and he went to establish his own city. So what the writer wants us to understand is that Cain is on a track of independence, and he's indif or, or, or indifference. He's indifferent to three things, God's plan, 
He's indifferent to God's person and he's indifferent to God's paradise. And what's amazing is that God reaches out to Cain to forgive him. He reaches out to Cain and shows grace. He reaches out to Cain to, to, to show kindness. I mean, the character of God in this account is, is, is mind-blowing. And what does Cain do? Well, Cain chooses the way that many people choose. We're indifferent to you, God. I want what I want. I'll get it in whatever way I can apart from you. And it is a deadly pursuit to, to embrace those three journeys, to be indifferent to God's plan, to be indifferent to God's person, and to be indifferent to God's paradise. Jesus said that you will not find life if you try to do it on your own terms. But if you die to yourself, if you lose your life for Jesus' sake, he says you will ultimately find it. Write down those passages, uh, Matthew 16, Mark 8, Luke 9. And the, the, the conundrum of what D Jesus teaches is, is this crazy, right? Wait, you're saying I have to lose something in order to gain it. Exactly. You lose yourself. You lose your plan. You lose your purposes. You lose your will. And God gladly gives you his because he has to bring you to the end of yourself to make himself glorious, to make himself awesome, to make himself gracious and kind and compassionate. This has nothing to do with you. This has everything to do with him. And once it begins with him, then you begin to understand your purpose and his plan. But you can't have it your way as opposed to God's way. So God's plan, what is God's plan? God's plan is for you to embrace his word, his will, not reject it. Cain knew exactly what God demanded of him, and Cain basically said, I'll reject your way and I'll embrace my own way. What is God's plan? It is clearly communicated to us in the scripture. It is clearly given to us in the word. And we must continue to sacrifice our plans in light of God's plans. That's a hard thing to do, isn't it? And not only that, we understand his plan in light of a person. That God doesn't want it for, for our destruction. God wants it for life. He wants it for joy. Right? Jesus came so that we may experience abundant life. He came so that we can experience abundant joy. Because apart from Jesus, joy and happiness are not found. But it's attached to a person. Any gift without the giver is empty. So his plan comes from his person. And when we understand his person, I mean, go back to verse 14 in Genesis 4. Cain basically says, I will choose to hide from your face. That's what he says to God, the Almighty. I'm going to choose a life where I hide from you as a person. Good luck with that. For the psalmist reminds us that if I go to the highest heights of heaven, you are there. If I go to the lowest depths of Sheol, you are there. You know when I rise, you know when I lie down, you know every word that is on my tongue, even before I speak it, you cannot escape the presence of God. We are in His presence right here, right now. And so self-disclosure, right? Because He knows all, and to understand the person of God and His grace and His kindness and His mercy as evidence in communion, the cross, right? We don't want to hide from him who knows all, who says to us, I accept, I accept you. That's awesome. And then ultimately his paradise. Right? But you know, you need to be reminded that our, our home is not here. Our paradise that God is creating is entirely of his doing. We create artificial paradises, don't we? We create artificial places that we would rather live in than the one that's actually given to us by God. We get a foretaste of it now, but ultimately, ladies and gentlemen, this is not our home. Like James had talked about last week, we're aliens, we're sojourners passing through. We don't plant our roots deep in this world. Why? Because here's what the Bible says. I'm going to give you a few verses. You need to be reminded of these things. Genesis, I mean, John chapter 14, verse 2. Jesus says, in my Father's house are many rooms. And guess what? One of them has a name on the door, your name, if you believe in Jesus. And he says, I'm going to prepare a place for you. Your place is not here. Your place is being built by Jesus right now. Woo! 
He's a good builder too, let me tell you that. How about the next verse, Psalm 127? The psalmist reminds us that unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. See, it's presenting this, this, this idea that this world's not our home. We're made for something else. And the Lord is the designer, the architect of that. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 10, the writer says, For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. This is found in the account of, of Abraham, who was a man of faith who believed in the coming Messiah, Christ, and said, this world is not my home, I'm merely passing through. And what compelled him to keep going day after day? Because he had his sight on the city, the heavenly city, spoken to us in Revelation chapter 21, whose designer and builder is God. Now I'm going to tell you right now, this is a hard thing to embrace when we live in the concrete jungle. Right? I love city life. I love city life. I love going to, to downtown environments to experience the, the urban culture. You've got restaurants, you've got buildings, you've got entertainment. I mean, it's exhilarating, isn't it? You go to any city, whether it be Phoenix, New York, Chicago, Las Vegas. I mean, it is amazing to just witness what man is able to do. But there's no rest in the city. You know what people in the city want? They want to go live out in the country, right? I mean, who are city people here? Just raise your hand. Who loves the city? Who loves the country? Raise your hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, here, here's the thing. What the city subliminally shows us is what man is able to do. And man is able to do things without giving God any glory or any credit. We build amazing monoliths, don't we? We build amazing things. And yet when we're in the city and we're surrounded by what man is able to do, God doesn't have to be obvious and present in that environment. But when you go to the country or you go to the ocean, what are you surrounded by? Things that man can't build and things that are created by God. And that's why when you stand at the edge of the Grand Canyon, when you're at the, 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 the beaches of, of, of California, you're in the, the redwood forests of, of Northern California, you're, you're at, you know, wherever, you, you, you go, this is amazing, right? Because something connects with our spirit that this is something that man can't create. This is a paradise that is truly from the hands of God. And I really believe that there are these evidences in creation that remind us that God is designing and building something that is going to be a perfect home for us. Right? But the city, the city, what it does is it perpetuates loneliness and alienation. Do you know the loneliest people in the world are people that live in cities? They have everything around them all the amenities you can imagine, but they are lonely, empty people. And I'm going to tell you right now that homelessness is a major problem in our world. And it's not the homeless people that we see. It's the homelessness that resides in every human heart that has no connection with the Creator. Because when you have an artificial paradise and no relationship with God, you are a wanderer and you are a vagabond longing for relationship but not having the capacity to have that relationship which brings satisfaction. There's a woman who wrote in the early part of the 20th century and I want to encourage you to read her writing. She died at a young age. Her name is Simone Vey. Her last name is spelled W-E-I-L. She was born to Jewish parents, grew up in Paris, France, World War I, World War II. Her book, Gravity and Grace, is fantastic. But another book she wrote, write this down, it's entitled The Need for Roots. This was a woman that was so intellectually strong, so well-educated, that she gladly gave up 
the riches that could have been hers. And she worked in the factories in France because she wanted to connect with people that were doing the blood, sweat, and tears of the labor in that day. And she wrote from the experiences of her relationship. And at being born into a Jewish home, they, they weren't practicing Jews, but there was somewhat of an understanding of God. But I'll tell you what, the older she got, she moved closer and closer to Christianity. And she wrote this book called The Need for Roots. And in it, basically, she presents this idea that the only cure for uprootedness, which we all feel as human beings, is a rediscovery of the human being as God's creature and of God himself as the source of all the basic elements our souls are longing for. And her conclusion, and I'm basically saving you to have to read this book. The conclusion is this. Our roots ultimately have to be in God. And if, we'll, if we will not have God, we are condemned to be vagabonds. So the question is, are your roots in Christ? Are you growing your roots deep into the person and work and ministry and teachings of Christ? Because he said, you're going to know my truth and that truth is going to set you free. Because there is no security apart from Christ. The world is scrambling for security. Scrambling, trying to pass laws and, and pass amendments and trying to change culture. And the more we change culture, the more we realize we're more, we're more insecure. Because by changing culture without changing the heart only deepens our feelings of abandonment and uprootedness from God. There's no security in that. We have to realize what man cannot do, God has done, and he invites us into relationship with him. This is not a time to be indifferent to Christ. This is a time to bow a humble knee to him who promises us life. Amen? Second point, in dependence from God. How does this play itself out? So Cain builds his city, right? We built this city. So he builds a city. There's his son Enoch, right? And again, it's just a monument to his power, his prosperity. God doesn't seem to be doing anything, and that's okay. God's still doing something. The fact that God is patient is a, is a characteristic of who he is as a, as, as, a, as a loving God, right? He allows Cain to build the city. Cain has children. Notice here the account. We're not going to go through the name of them, but one of the kids named Lamech, he took for himself two wives. He has kids. They accomplished so many achievements, and yet there's a conclusion in Lamech's account where he has this song, and it's really the first song recorded for us in Scripture, of vengeance and how glorious vengeance is. So there's three things I want you to, to consider out of this section. That when you grow independent of God, and it's a sad statement when you have everything but God, what happens to any culture is there's an increase in excessive sexuality. There's an increase in exhilarating innovations. And there's an increase in extreme violence. Let's talk about each of those briefly. Because at the core, we're talking about sin. And sin is an assertion of autonomy. It is basically saying to God, Thanks, but no thanks. I got this. Yeah, your, your will is clear, but I'm going to choose to do my own thing. So it is an assertion of autonomy. It is, it is a transgression of divine boundaries. We live in a world where there's rules, and even Cosmo Kramer got it right on Seinfeld where he said to Jerry, if there are no rules, there's chaos, Jerry. This is Harry's, right? You guys know? 
Like even Cosmo Kramer, the theologian in the 90s that he was, right? If there are no rules, there's chaos. So what sin does is it says we're able to transgress divine boundaries. God has established boundaries just like any loving parent says there are rules. You don't do this or you get hurt. The stove is hot. Don't touch it. Boundary. Kid touches it. Ah! Right? There's a reason why I told you these things. So sin is a transgression of divine boundaries. And when you transgress those boundaries, it doesn't lead to life. It leads to death. It doesn't lead to relationship. It leads to alienation. And so one writer said it this way. I love this quote. Freedom, which does not discern the boundaries of human life, leaves us anxious. And I do believe at its core, anxiety and worry and stress is indicative of a heart that is transgress divine boundaries. So what happens here in Genesis? Excessive sexuality. This guy, Lamech, takes two wives. And like I said before, I mean, I mean, having multiple wives may be itself its own punishment, but having two mother-in-laws? Are you crazy, Lamech? What are you thinking? So what you have, you have a man who's a bigamist, you have a man who's a polygamist. First account in scripture where a man clearly goes against God's design of marriage. And this is what men and women do. We don't like the parameters you've set upon us, God. And what are his parameters? As a reminder, write this down. One man, one woman for one lifetime, that's marriage. Anything outside of that transgresses God's divine boundaries. And yet we become this permissive culture that allows things outside of that. At what point does our permissiveness end? Because ladies and gentlemen, the excessive sexuality, you think you've heard it or seen it all, it will get worse. It will get disgusting. And it's not because God is some cosmic killjoy who doesn't want us to experience sexuality. He designed us this way. Boys and girls, peepees, vajayjays, you know, you know, all these things. He designed us with these organs and these, ex- these pleasures, right? But he designed them to be experienced in a specific context. And every time you express these things outside of his divine boundaries, it takes a piece of your humanness away from you. Like the kid who sticks his tongue to the frozen light post in a Christmas story. You don't get your tongue off that thing without losing a little bit piece of it left on the light post. Ladies and gentlemen, we must be men of women of self-control. Just because you feel something doesn't mean you act upon your feelings. We are not animals that live in the jungles that act upon those desires and those yearnings. We are men and women creating the image of God that we reserve those things for its proper context. Lamech takes for himself two wives. This was never designed by God. This was never condoned by God. This is never acceptable to God. And the track record of men and women who embrace excessive sexuality in Scripture, none of the examples lead to a positive end. Amen? We must exercise self-control because we don't want to live in a culture that is running rampant where everyone just gets to live without self-control. We're seeing evidences of this today, and I don't want it to get worse. God does this for our good. And so, anything but one man and one woman for one lifetime is a rejection of God's plan for marriage, for family. Second thing we see is these exhilarating innovations. Look at the children of Lamech. Remember these guys, Jabel, Jubal, Tubal, you know? Think about what these guys, notice what scripture gives us. It gives us what these guys were innovators in. The first Jabel, this guy developed husbandry, meaning he excelled in livestock. He created a science in the cattle business 
And the idea, but even behind his name, is that he was a marketer. So he was able to take a craft, turn it into a job, and take care of his family. And he became this businessman whose specific job was to raise livestock and sell it. So he was an innovator in prosperity. The second son, whose name is Jubal, will notice that he was the musician of the family. Jacob, right? Like right, right up your wheelhouse, right? He, he loved music. He loved creating musical instruments. Just a couple he created. Oh, just the lyre and the pipe. Hello, thank you, Jubal. This guy had created these things. He developed his specialty in music and musical instruments. And so he's the innovator of pleasure. Because what is music when we listen to it, right? We have a hard day. We put on Adele. So we realize we're not the only ones suffering in broken, selfish, selfish relationships, right? Or we're angry. So we throw in Metallica, right? It's like, ah, you know? Or you just have fun with your kids and learn easy riffs like ACDC, Dirty Deeds. Yes, my kids know Dirty Deeds done dirt cheap. You can still love Jesus and listen to ACDC, all right? But music, boy, what a, what a pleasurable experience it is. There's the music that makes us smile. There's the music that makes us cry. There's the music that connects us with another world, Bach, Beethoven. There's the music that speaks to our current situations. So he creates this thing called music. And then there's a the third son, Tubal. Cain, this guy worked with metal. He was the first to create metallurgy. He was the one that brought the industrial revolution to the ancient world. And, and they built weapons, which now means he's the innovator of power. Because when you have metal and you have weapons, you end up being the strong kid on the block. So three kids... Innovator of prosperity, innovator of pleasure, innovator of power. All good things, but not apart from God. And this is the amazing thing about culture, is that we live in a world where men and women exercise this quality that God has put in us and hasn't put in any other part of creation. Right? Right? The animal world doesn't build buildings like we build buildings. The animal world doesn't create music like we create music. There is something unique about the human creature, right? Where we display the image of God in our creative power. But those things are never a substitute for Him. Those things are never meant to lead you away from those things and our creativeness were meant to connect us to Him. Because I will tell you, when culture acts out of obedience to God, resulting in thankfulness and glory to Him, that's when culture is where God wants it to be. But when culture acts out of a disconnect and doesn't want to obey God and doesn't do the things it does for His glory and to express thankfulness to Him, that is an empty culture. And so what God shows us here is that true enjoyment of all these things is ultimately derived out of obedience to Him and thankfulness to Him. The problem is we have these technical abilities and yet we are morally failing. Someone once said, culture used or abused offers no redemption. Think about how excited we get about innovations in our world. And here's the thing I keep scratching my head over. The new Apple iPhone comes out. The new Samsung Galaxy comes out. They're just competing with each other, right? And we all get excited and we all lovingly fight with each other. What's better? Blah, blah, blah. But nothing is able to answer the deepest problems our experience as humans. Amen? There's no innovation that is able to deal with the human heart and the human condition. We get excited about so much stuff. New stadium, yeah, new skyscraper, yeah, new roller coaster, wow. And yet all these things are developed at the expense of us becoming less and less human in our connection with God and with each other. And the last thing we see here is excessive or extreme violence. So there's this idea of sexuality, there's this idea of creativeness, there's this idea of violence. 
And I don't have to give you illustrations of how violent we are continuing to become as a, human, as a society. Do I? We see it all around us. And yet it goes back to the song of Lamech. This is a song this man sings. And look what he says. He says, I killed a man for wounding me. A boy at that for striking me. He glories in his violent accomplishment. Johnny Cash, I killed a man in Reno just to watch him die. This is the law of retaliation. This is in Latin what is known as the lex talionis. Right? This retributive justice that Lamech takes pride in because he's looking at Cain, his descendant, and he's saying God didn't do what he needed to do with Cain. And his punishment is that if someone hurts him seven, seven times, well, guess what? I'm going to take my violence and take it to the next level where I'm going to say I don't need God. I'll take matters into my own hands because God's not doing what he needs to do. Therefore, I will do what I need to do when it comes to justice. And may it be 70 times seven, anyone who tries to come after me. This is his song. He glories in his violence. And it is no, no chance, it's not by accident, that Jesus, in talking about forgiveness, says you forgive someone who does you wrong 70 times 7. Isn't it amazing that all of a sudden that we have this bridge that's connected from Lamech song to Jesus' teaching says you cannot survive as a culture if you embrace the law of retaliation. You survive as a culture when you embrace the law of reconciliation. Amen? Church, listen to me. We must guard our hearts against anger. We must guard our hearts against bitterness. Yes, people will screw you over. People will do you wrong. People will hurt you. But God has taken all those things upon himself and says to the world, though you may crucify me, I'm going to love you and I'm going to extend forgiveness to you. And as God's people who have been forgiven of the sins that we know and we're well aware of in our own hearts, we sit there and go, glory be to God for loving me, a wretched sinner that I am. And now I go forth, not perpetuating a culture of violence, which gets us nowhere. We perpetuate a culture of reconciliation that is the answer to all of our souls. Jesus says, vengeance, God is the one who will take care of justice. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord, Romans chapter 12. You love your neighbor. You show kindness to your neighbor. When your neighbor is hungry, you feed them. When your neighbor is thirsty, you give him a cup of cold water, even if that neighbor is your enemy. Why? Because the law of reconciliation is the law that will exceed to the glory of God. The law of retaliation just hurts people. And we are not a culture that does that. So Lamech, he's learning his lessons right now. He's spending eternity realizing where violence gets you. See, whenever a culture disregards the value of human life, it will end up disastrous. How a culture treats its elderly, how a culture treats the unborn will show you what that culture values. And I'm afraid we live in a culture that is in, in, influenced by Lamech right now. When it comes to issues of euthanasia, when it comes to the issues of abortion, we need to be people who champion the sanctity of life. And God help us, should we express the idea that we can murder the unborn like that just happened in Ireland where the women were crying out with tears of joy that now it is legal to kill their children. And you're wondering why people walk into high schools and shoot? 
You're wondering why people walk into newspaper buildings and shoot. You're wondering why there's homicidal stories on our news every single night. Because your right to be in control of your life is ending up with disastrous results. All life is sacred. Amen. All life is valuable. Amen. Every single person, man, woman, child, is born in the image of God, whether they're ex utero or in utero. Amen. There is this thing called life that is growing inside a woman, a capacity and a thing that a woman can only experience, a man can experience. There is differences among the genders and the sexes. Don't let the society tell you that we need to have this gender blurring thing, baloney. What makes us different is one of the things is that there's a womb man. That's what woman means, womb man. She has a womb. I don't. And trust me, there's times I'm like, thank God for that. <laughs> but the value of that which is unborn, that God says, I knew you when I formed you in your mother's womb, Psalm 139. That even the prophet Jeremiah in chapter 1 can declare to God, you had a purpose for me even before I was born. Before the foundation of the world, you have been chosen in Christ, Ephesians chapter 1. You don't tell me a woman has a right over her body. Self-living. If you've had an abortion, I want you to know, caveat right here, having an abortion is not the unforgivable sin. But going forward from this day to be men and women who love Jesus and talk about the sanctity of life, that is in concert with each other. And don't you dare call yourself a Christian and say you can be pro-choice. That's baloney. I was about to get R-rated there for a minute. I'm sorry. But any culture that devalues the elderly and destroys the unborn is a culture that dies from within. Good luck, America. Happy days are here again, right? My concern is not for America. My concern is about your soul. And what city you are building. Are you building a city unto yourself? Or are you building a city for God? Are you living for you or are you living for God? That's the question. I love this country. But I have a responsibility to live in a manner consistent with the teachings of Jesus Christ and the teachings of the Word. Amen? And if you call yourself a Christian, you do too. Last point. Do we have about 30 more minutes? No, I'm just kidding. We're not going to go that long. The Sethite civilization. And I close with this, but it's going to serve us well for the next couple weeks. Because chapter 5 is about the, the, the Sethite civilization and why this is important. A God-centered society. Three qualities of a God-centered society. Praising the provision of God. Pioneering the worship of God. Proclaiming the nature of God. Look at what it says here. So Adam had relations with his wife. She gives birth to his son, names him Seth. Because why? She said God had appointed me another offspring and See, Abel was the righteous one. And all they've seen now through the lineage of Cain is unrighteousness. And so there's a moment of praising the provision of God that the promise in Genesis 3 verse 15 is still intact. That God will provide a deliverer. God will provide one to rescue us from our despicable condition. And so she praises God for the provision of her son, Enosh, which means one who is frail or one who is mortal. Because implied in the name of Enosh, the, the child born of Seth, born of Adam and Eve, is this. We need God. Don't we? Or have we been so inculcated by our ideology of a culture as America where we pull ourselves by our, by our bootstraps? We're Americans. Go get it, right? And so we learn to do things. It becomes self-sufficient. And that is so anti-Scripture. 
you are frail, you are mortal, you are weak. Sorry to tell it to you. You need God, I need God. And this is what is spoken of in the name Enosh. So there's no boasting in self. Seth confessed his need for God and named the baby Enosh. And it was a communication that there is this promise that would stay alive now through Seth's line. Because out of the line of Seth comes Jesus. Second thing, pioneering the worship of God. See, while Cain and his ancestors pioneered these cities and these accomplishments, Seth's firstborn and successors pioneer worship. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's nothing worth more than pioneering an attitude of worship. Amen? To have the moniker attached to your life that they live for God is everything. Matter of fact, write that phrase down. They lived for God. Because men and women who love Christ are often the unsung heroes of the world. The men and women that live in this world and they may not accomplish anything, they may not contribute anything, they, they may not, not invent any new earth-shaking contraptions, they may introduce no revolutionary art forms, they devise no way to advance their family fortunes, but they simply live for God. I'm going to tell you, those are the ones that God recognizes. You may not make a name for yourself in this world. That's good because that's exactly what God doesn't want you to do. He wants you to make a name for Christ because you who dwell in Christ have his name now on you. And he says to you one day, welcome home son, welcome home daughter, because the things of this world will die and waste away, but you and your soul will live forever. <laughs> Woo! I'm hanging out with my, my family at Superstition Springs Mall yesterday. Because that's what we, we like to do on our Saturday afternoons. Eat Chick-fil-A in the food court, right? We know how to party, right? And I'm looking at, and I remember the day when Superstition Springs was the mall in the valley. And now I look at it and I go, this is a great location for a zombie outbreak movie. More than half the stores are closed. It is just nasty. And I sit there and go, those are the monuments to men and women. Who remembers the name? Who re Some of you are like, there's a mall over at Superstition Springs? There is. Easily forgotten, but those who live for God are never forgotten by God. Amen? You live for God and you pioneer worship in your home and your culture. You are doing what God wants you to do. Which brings us to the last point, and that is proclaiming the nature of God. So those of us who are known by God and live for God, what we do now is we go out and we tell the world, not only about the names of our God, but the nature of our God. The, 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 the nature and His character and how He acts and what He's done for us. And namely, the most important thing He's done for us is that He sent His Son to die for us upon a cross. The death we deserve, but He took for Himself and He demonstrates His love in, toward us that Christ dies for us. So tell me about your God again. He's a forgiving God. He's a loving God. He's a gracious God. He's a merciful God. He's a kind God. He's a compassionate God. He's a God who would rather die for you than live without you. Tell me more about this God. Amen? He's patient. He's long-suffering. To God be the glory. Amen? And we praise God for His indescribable gift of Christ. Amen? And my prayer is that you will now live, if you haven't already been doing it, you live for God. Stop living for yourself and start living for Him. Let's stand, let's pray. Mm, God, you have been so good to us and given us this time and loving us as we are, where we are, and accepting us into your love. And, and it there's just truths that I, I'm considering that are oftentimes too difficult to express, Lord, because you who know us through and through still choose to have a relationship with us, and for that we're grateful. Be glorified in our lives, Lord, as evidence of what we have received 
from you, let us now live in a manner consistent with our calling in Christ, with our identity in Christ. May we go out into the world as your ambassadors, as your missionaries, to tell the world that there's an answer to the disease, that there's a cure for the heart problem, and the answer is Jesus. The answer is Christ. The answer is the cross. Because there is no hope apart from him. Help us to be champions of that message. Help us to love when we're not loved in return. Help us to be agents of reconciliation when we're experiencing contexts of hostility. Lord, help us live lives reflecting the character of Jesus for your glory and our good. And we pray this in Christ's name. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord lift his face toward you and give you his grace and peace forever and ever. Have a great day. Hey, thanks for watching the video. We uh, hope you've been blessed and encouraged by, uh, by watching it. Stay tuned for future videos. Uh, if you're ever in the Phoenix area, we'd love for you to join us in person at Sozo Coffee. We're at Warner and Alma School. Two services every Sunday, 9 and 1045. Check out the churchisaverb.org for more information. Have a great week. We'll see you soon. Thank you.